I will hand over to Roger, who, if he can string four words together, um, will get some sort of virtual award because he has also been homeschooling, but teenagers. Um, so uh, thank you so much for spending some time with us this evening. And we're really looking forward to hearing your presentation. Um, and over to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Louise. Yeah, like you, I, I am struggling to string words together too. <laughs> and um, by the way, I am I'm drinking Brewdog this evening. So this is Pale Ale. Uh, uh, I, I have come to know many drinks very well uh, during lockdown, and this has become my favourite, so I, I like it quite a bit. Uh, the problem with, with uh, drinking for me, though, is there comes a point when I'm drinking where um, half my vocabulary suddenly vanishes. So let, let's hope that doesn't happen in the next 20 minutes, because that, that's not going to be good for this talk. Yeah, so I, I'm going to talk about befriending boredom. Um, I'm I'm Roger Bretherson, been introduced. Um, I work in the School of Psychology at the University of Lincoln. I'm a clinical psychologist by background, so I spent the first decade of my career um, in the NHS, largely working with people with personality disorders and things like depression, anxiety, trauma, things like that. And um, more recently, over the last half decade or so, I've started studying almost the flip side of what it is that clinical psychologists study. So in psychology, we call those character strengths or maybe psychological strengths. So I have the delight of, well, every day really thinking about interest and gratitude and wonder and love and care and bravery and all, all those kind of things that we're all sort of struggling to find during the pandemic. Um, I, and the interesting thing about tonight is that technically boredom isn't really an area of my expertise. It's just that when I was starting to learn about interest and how we learn things and what it meant to have a good learning experience I just stumbled into this absolutely fascinating literature on boredom and I thought well why don't I talk about that it sounds really really interesting I'm really curious about it let's get into some boredom and talk about it a little bit and um, the danger of it is given that it's not the area I spend my whole life thinking about is that it could be that when you ask me questions I don't know the answer to them but um yeah, so it could be that one of the interesting things tonight will be seeing me being professionally and intellectually humiliated in the question time. <laughs> but, you know, that that's happened before and it, it, it was all fine. So um, let's talk, as they say on YouTube, let's get into it, shall we? Um, so, um, but believe it or not, they, they, there has actually been an enormous amount of research done on boredom by psychologists across the world. So particularly um, European and Chinese and American psychologists have been very, very interested in what boredom is and how it works. So let, let me start with sort of one of the leading people in the field, Reinhard Peckron, um, came up with a definition of boredom. Um, and this was his. Uh, Peckron uh, and Hill are famous for something called the... Um, uh, control value theory of learning. So that's, the, that's their kind of thing. But, but behind that is the idea of what makes us interest, what stops us being bored. So Reinhard Peckram basically said that boredom is a unique emotional experience consisting of five underlying components. Just remember that next time you're bored, you're not just bored, you're having a unique emotional experience of five, no, not four, not six, five underlying components. And according to Peckram, they are these. So it, effective. So it's unpleasant. It's an aversive sensation to be bored. So here's the interesting thing. And this is why boredom is quite relevant to us right now. So um, just this week, um, the Happiness Institute published one of their studies of well-being, psychological well-being during the lockdown. And um, they took roughly kind of just over 3000 people um, across the world. And it was a longitudinal survey starting in April, ending in July. So that kind of first lockdown period for most of us. And um, one of the things they noticed in that is, is that firstly, wh when you measure people's sort of positive emotion or you, you measure what we call their eudaimonic well-being, their general sense of being OK, weirdly, that hasn't changed quite so much. But what has changed an incredible amount are our negative emotions. So our negative emotions have gone up quite a bit during the pandemic. No surprise. Now, what, what, what the Happiness Institute found in their research, which is absolutely fascinate, fascinating, is when you do the regression, about which nation people are in uh, and the occurrence of uh, COVID, you know, how much COVID is going on, what, what are the sort of referral rates occurring? What they found is that that's closely related to the increase in negative emotion. And number one, which won't surprise any of us, 
is anxiety. So people get more anxious. The more stories you're hearing about people being admitted to hospital, etc., the more anxious you're likely to be. But then interestingly, following behind that, I would have thought it would be depression or sadness or something like that, is actually boredom. So one of the main effects that, that COVID is having on us in the moment is we're all a bit more scared and we're a bit more bored. And that's why Peckron says that boredom has this effective element. It's unpleasant, it's aversive. We don't really like it. We're not always quite sure what to do with it. So it also has, has cognitive. So when we're bored, um, our, our perception of time change, time flies when you're having fun, not quite so much when you're bored. Um, it's motivational. So very often in boredom, we want to disengage. We want to withdraw from the things that bore us. We'll come back to that. Um, it, it tends to have a physiological component. So it tends to have this sort of sense of it. It's a state of low arousal. Sometimes, if you've ever noticed, it sometimes has this sort of odd high arousal element to it as well. So particularly, you know, for people who are in hospital at the moment, maybe they're not too ill, they're just trying to get by and survive. Uh, and I, if you've ever been in hospital, sort of sitting around someone's bedside or having one of those kind of moments, you often have that strange swinging from being bored and also being traumatized at the same time. It's a really kind of strange combination of physiology. Uh, and it's got an, an, an expressive component, according to Petron. So it's focal, facial, postural expressions. You can tell when people are bored. And that's why I really like the picture of this young woman here. You can't quite see her face anymore, but basically she has this sort of withering look, um, which I think if anyone gave to me, uh, I, I, I would probably wither up and die if I had to look at that. Now, now, the interesting thing is we're, we're psychologists and psychologists never like things to be simple. It's gotta be very complex and we've got to have, you know, for every two psychologists, you need at least three opinions. Um, and so um, Thomas Goetz, um, there's some really interesting work on experience sampling of boredom. So Petrons is a sort of sort of global model. Thomas Goetz is saying, yeah, but what, what is it actually like to be bored? And when we take samples of people describing their experience of being bored, how, how can we organize those statistically? So um, uh, Goetz and his colleagues come up with this sort of, this sort of two, two dimensional model. They say, firstly, uh, there's, there's some elements of boredom that can be positive, there's others that can be negative. So it may not just be a, a negative effect of experience. And then, and then it has an arousal sort of difference where what, at the bottom end they say that's as being calm and at the top end they say fidgety. Um, I don't know if that's a particularly scientific word, but you know, it works for me. And um, so, so Goetz and his colleagues effectively said that there's these different views of boredom. So they say so the, the sort of positive boredom, if you like. So we're fairly calm. It feels fairly positive. It's in different boredom. Yeah, I'm bored, but I don't really care. Sunday afternoon, sitting around, having a nice beer, a little bit bored, doesn't matter. There's then calibrating boredom. So we're going a little bit up the arousal spectrum here. It starts to feel a little bit more negative. This is the kind of boredom where you start to think, hmm, should I do something? Or I, am I really bored? Is this boredom something I should be doing something about now? Not quite sure. And then there's searching boredom. So again, we're getting we're getting more aroused now. We're beginning to think, oh yeah, I'm bored, and I really I really want something to do. If if you've got kids like I have, or or teenagers in the house, this is the boredom where they come. Oh, Dad, I'm bored. It's like I want you to come up with some solution to my boredom. Come up with some activity I could do. And sometimes we have that conversation with ourselves. Then, then getting further up the arousal spectrum, we have reactant boredom. And reactant boredom is starting again to feel even more negative. But this is the kind of thing where, where we start to get almost kind of a bit angry and thrashy and annoyed. Oh, I can't sit still. If you've ever had a long plane flight and you're starting to feel uncomfortable. And I, I once came back from a 19-hour flight and decided the next day to go to the cinema. And I just could not sit still because I didn't want to be sat still. It's reactant boredom in that sense. And then, and then dropping right down again, there's apathetic boredom. This is um, bored and can't be asked. That's really what it is. It's kind of like, I just can't be bothered to do anything. So it doesn't feel particularly good, but it doesn't have lots of energy to it either. And, and Goethe effectively says, and number six, boredom. <laughs> so all those kind of distinctions. Number six is the, the kind of mean average of where all those sits. That, that for most of us, the state of boredom, when you try and work out what's at the middle of it all, is, is something that's sort of mildly negative and sort of mildly arousing. So it's sort of, it's a bit of a meh kind of emotion. It doesn't really feel like much of anything, which is why I think we spend a lot of time trying to work out what to do with it. Now, one, one of the debates that, that's been going on in, in, in the, the boredom field 
given that everyone's interested enough in it to, to debate it, is, is really a debate about um, when we measure boredom, are we really measuring boredom or are we measuring something else? So for example, if you have a bunch of students who sit through a lecture and you ask them at the end of the semester to measure how boring they found certain uh, subjects, it can actually be that you're not measuring boredom. It's more likely that you're actually measuring their disgust. So you're more likely measuring their sense of this subject is horrible and I hate it and I never want to go near it again, or this lecturer doesn't interest me or anything like that. Um, so, so some of these more sort of experiential models of boredom, sort of using immediate sampling, using um, brain scanning and different ways of looking at boredom in the moment have kind of sort of reframed boredom a little bit. Um, so um, Yohista Mugon talks about this, basically looks at a series of neuro neuroimaging studies that seem to describe the state of boredom and really speculates that boredom might be this. The bored individual may be stuck in their internal thoughts and bodily sensations, unable to shift attention successfully to the, environ the environment around them. In other words, it's this sort of sense of it just being stuck almost the, the philosopher Kierkegaard used to talk about the idea of shut upness, of being shut in ourselves, not being able to get out, not being able to engage or be motivated or things like that. And Mugon's really getting at something similar and saying that seems to be what boredom is. Now, I hope you have um, signed up uh, to the uh, WhatsApp group, because in a moment I'm going to ask you a question and a very, very quick fire, couple of words. want to hear um, some of your answers to the following question. So given that boredom tends to be that sort of situation, um, when you look at something like academic boredom, basically what, what you find is in, in, in one meta-analysis of 29 studies of students saying, I was really bored with that, what you find is it's negatively, um, academic boredom is related to motivation, to study behaviours and achievement. Now that says negatively related, what it actually means is that those things decrease as boredom goes up. Yep. So, yeah, sorry, those things decrease with boredom. So they're less motivated, they do fewer study behaviours and their achievement goes down as well as the more bored they become. Um, and the other thing is that those measures of boredom seem to increase over the academic year. So uh, when, I, when I speak to my students, I'm like, hey, this is week four, guys. If you think you're bored now, just wait till week eight. That's boredom, folks. And so it's kind of like this thing of, what is going on here and what should we do about some of our boredom and you might feel like that in lockdown that this is quite a boring time what can engage me what can i do about it so here's my question for you and if you can pop um, a few messages into the whatsapp i've got my phone here i can spot them as they come through when you are bored what do you do about it so when you're bored what do you do about it just pop some things in into the whatsapp group and i'll see um what comes up there it usually takes a few minutes just for a few things to come through. So when you're bored, what do you do about it? Any, any answers will do. I say that with due trepidation. We do not know what's going to come through at this moment. So when you're bored, what do you do about it? Pop it into the WhatsApp and uh, we'll, um, we'll start to have a think about some of those things. Lots of different ways we can deal with boredom. Um, if you've been looking online, you'll probably see actually quite a few people have been writing articles about the various different strategies they use to deal with boredom at the moment. So when, when you're bored, what, what do you do about it? You know, usually you wait for questions at the end of this. Um, and so um, the great thing for me is as a clinical psychologist, um, awkward silence is kind of what I do. So um, if this moment of silence on, on WhatsApp scares you, um, it, uh, I'm fine, I think. <laughs> so Evie, I, I'm looking at, at the WhatsApp. Is anything coming through or should I just move on? Yes. Ooh, people, okay. people are definitely not bored by your talk. Okay, um, I'm, I'm obviously on the... So there's a rapid fire of reactions to your question, so I'm just going to dive in straight. Go on, give us a few. Um, I try to find a friend to chat to, drink gin, computer <laughs> game, complain. I agree with that one, complain. Mm -hmm. Exercise, read and smoke. Pick up my phone. We've probably all been there, right? Uh, when I'm bored, I study Spanish. Mm. 
I mean, come on. <laughs> uh, what, I'm, what I'm doing, I do one of my hobbies, get up, walk about the flat and annoy my wife who's actually working. <laughs> uh, browse, browse Instagram or Twitter. Um, it's, uh, uh, I eat, I cycle endlessly between Twitter, WhatsApp and Reddit and try and find new content to divert. <laughs> and Netflix. Um, I really want to answer these questions, but I don't have the energy. So <laughs> uh, staring into space takes up a lot of time. Yeah. And he was never, this person was never allowed to be bored when they were a child. Ooh. YouTube surfing, right. research ways not to be bored, go for a walk, <laughs> Twitter, walk, eat, pro social media, social media. When I realize I'm bored, I move to a different room that can take a while to realize I'm bored. Go on Tinder. Oh, wow. Great. Oh, this, is good. this is good. I browsed daily comments. Uh, daily <laughs> comments. I say I'm bored. Crosswords. When I'm bored, I do crosswords or play another game. I leave it there. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Evie. Fantastic. Yes, yeah, so in loads of kind of different ways that, that we are... We, we cope with boredom in all kinds of different ways. It's that sort of aversive emotional feeling that we try and move away from. Now, um, I interestingly, th th there's actually been um, a field of work um, done uh, by Ulrika Nett and her colleagues where, where they, they, they kind of took a list of all the kind of boredom strategies that people came up with and again, conceptualized them, tried to put them in a model. Like what, what do these um, things make sense of? I said, so some people cope with boredom by approaching it. Other people uh, uh, deal with boredom by avoidance strategies. And some of them are cognitive, i.e. sort of stuff we do in our head. And some of them are behavioral things we do in our body. And um, so, so, they, so, so they call these people different kind of people. So, so some people are reappraisers. So they get bored and they think, how can I reconceptualize this situation so I view it in a different way? So particularly if you're stuck in a situation that you can't change that much, how do I try and get interested? You know, maybe you're bored in this talk. Maybe maybe there's, there's something about it you can find interesting somewhere. Um, they, they found that behavioral approaches, these are people who uh, take action when they're bored. They call them the criticizers because quite often these are the people who, who don't tolerate boredom. They're kind of like, I want to do something about it. I'm going to approach it. I'm going to make something happen. If this talk is boring, I'm going to comment on that and make sure that it, it gets more interesting. Um, other people are distractors. So these are the people who enjoy staring at the wall, gazing into space, fantasizing, enjoying the, the rich life of the mind that is available to all of us. Um, and then there's evaders. So let's go for a one, go for a jog, uh, uh, ride a bike, uh, mess about, leave the room, walk around the house, annoy the wife by the sounds of things. You know, the, these are the people who just find a way of kind of escaping it, getting out of it. Now, the, the interesting thing is, is when, when you start to look at this, it's, it's that firstly, when you look at people who use the reappraising strategy with boredom, firstly, they, they report being bored less often. So, so they're more likely, even when they're stuck in a boring situation, they're more likely to be able to find a different way of working with it. They report being more engaged in life overall. So they report saying, well, basically I find ways of really engaging in states of flow and enjoyment I, and they achieve more. Uh, I mean, that's not much of a surprise, is it? When you look at research on self-regulation that says 20% uh, of the time, all of us, when we're working, are fighting the temptation to do something else. Uh, number one is sleep. Number two is sex, actually, in the study it, it, at work. Uh, num number three is social media stuff. Number four is food. So, you know, all the time we're trying to stay engaged and trying to stay achieved. But what, what's interesting about this, going back to just one of the other people I quoted a moment ago, is in the moment state boredom is the negatively valenced feeling associated with being cognitively disengaged, not the cause of disengagement. So what I'm saying here is that bore, it's, sometimes we think of it this way, I get bored and then I don't want to do something. You know, that, that's the way it is. Or I get bored and then if you're a student, I don't want to study. So that, that's kind of what I'm often thinking about at work when I'm lecturing undergraduates particularly. But, but one of the things that seems to come up out of this is that boredom itself is the state of being disengaged. That It is the state of being disengaged. It's not that we, we get disengaged and then we get bored or we get bored and then we move on. It is the state of being disengaged. 
So um, we don't have time to go to the chat for this one, um, but um, it might be nice. Just, I mean, you can put this in the chat. I just won't have time to feed back on it for the time being, but it might, might be nice to think about what's the most interesting subject in the world. So if boredom is the state of being disengaged, what's the thing that's most interesting in the world? And usually when I put this out to people, we get all kinds of different answers. But what I'm going to do today is skip quickly to the answer. This is not my opinion. This is the answer. This is the most interesting thing in the world. And the most interesting subject in the world, cheesy revealing slide, is actually you. Or more accurately, yourself. And the reason I say this is based on... Um, a whole series of studies done on something called self-relatedness. And to cut a very long sort of neuroscientific story short in a couple of minutes, is that basically you, you have a self system. So this is George Northop's basic model of the self, which is when you're in your resting state, your brain is scanning your environment for things that are of interest to you, related to you. You also have a reward system. So this is those structures in the brain that anticipate um, reward or, or light up when you receive something that stimulates you in the environment, they trigger you approaching it, they trigger you learning it, and they trigger you incorporating those things. So, so your reward system gives value and interest to the stimuli around you. And what's interesting is that your self system and your reward system are overlapping structures in the brain. So when something is related to you, you're sort of automatically kind of interested in it. And there's various studies done on this in, in perception studies. If you're given shapes and one of them's given your name, you're more likely to recognize it and spot it. Um, you're more likely to retain information that is about you. Um, and in application, utility value interventions improve academic performance. What do I mean by that? Let me just finish with this. So utility value interventions are, are basically the idea, the rationale is that when you're trying to get to grips with something that you're interested in, um, you're more likely to remember if it's personally relevant. So I will skip these two squares here and jump to the bottom. So basically, a, a utility value intervention is a way of trying to make the things around you interesting to you, like get them into you. So here's, here's what you can do while you're locked down and while you're bored. The first way we make things interesting to us is that we reflect on it. So for example, I, I teach psychology students statistics and there's a famous study that was done where one group were told after the lecture to write a summary, another group were told to write about how it related to them. And lo and behold, what you found is that those who wrote about how it was related to them performed much better than the students who were asked to write a summary. They remembered it so much better. Um, and the interesting thing is that that effect was especially strong for the weaker students. So how does it relate to you? That's one way of thinking about it. Second way to think about it is in relationships. So this is an example of parents encouraged to talk to their children about maths and science classes. I've been doing a lot of that, not very well over the last few weeks. Um, and basically in this study, what happens is that they got children to personalize the findings and maths and science to themselves. Think about what does this make in relationship with other people. Um, it doesn't have to be parents, uh, it can be a peer relationship, or it can be a study group as well. So what, what does all this mean? What, what's the take home from this? We can talk a bit about different ways of coping with boredom in, in, in the chat if you wish to, but, but here's, here's the take home. So firstly, if there is a take home to the, this, it's that things like Nerd Night are really good. At a time like this, when you're wondering, how do I overcome boredom? That study done by the Happiness Institute that I described said that COVID rates, th those kind of negative emotions, boredom and anxiety, were particularly related to loneliness. And the interesting thing is that loneliness isn't about how many people do you live with, it's how many people do you have meaningful contact about something that matters to you in the course of the day. So one way of overcoming boredom is, who's interested in the stuff you're interested? Go to ne Nerd Night, join your book club, you know, make sure you get on Zoom and speak to people that, that interest you. The second thing is the reflection piece is even though you're bored and you might be alone, what's in this for you? What can you learn? What can you take away? Um, you know, we didn't get to Donald Trump, but you know what? I'm out of time. And if anyone's really interested still in Donald Trump, you can ask me that in the chat. So that's boredom and how to befriend it. Um, over to you, Evie. Thank you. That was great. Not boring at all. Really enjoyed it.
uh, especially the plug for Nerd Night. Yes, it's good for you. Um, I'm afraid to say that the only response to your what is the most interesting topic, um, there is just one response and that is capitalism. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, <laughs> questions. On the basis of the components of emotional experience, how would we differentiate boredom from depression? I can certainly see a lot of these aspects in myself at my darker times. Yeah. Now, now why, why don't I sort of answer this by going to what I was going to say about Donald Trump? Because it's, it's actually relevant to kind of come, I'll come back to depression at the end of it. Um, it because basically the, the kind of boredom state is a state of numbing, really. So it's a state of sort of being numb inside. And when you speak to people who are depressed, very often they won't describe being sad. They often describe feeling numb or feeling like they're in a fog or feeling like they're stuck. So this kind of idea is that there is a similarity between depression and boredom in the sense that um, one way of conceptualizing depression is to say depression is kind of like a sadness that, that can't be comforted. It can't be taken away by comforting yourself, making social contact, no matter what you do, it doesn't go. And so there are some real similarities between boredom and depression but but I would say that boredom as an emotional state is probably subordinate to, to depression so it's not unusual for depressed people quite often to feel afflicted by boredom and the reason I, I was going to bring up Donald Trump is because actually so when we talk about self-related lists you know how Donald Trump loved to have his name on everything and one of the reasons for that is because he has this sort of narcissistic personality and narcissistic personalities aren't in love with themselves they're in love with a grandiose image of themselves which means that the threshold for him to see something as self-related is much higher for him than it is for the average person and so it's kind of another kind of mental health related thing really it is therefore the kind of the average state of the narcissistic individual when they're not being grandiose and grand or or rageful with people who attack their ego is boredom because things don't trigger their sense of it being self-related. So an answer to depression, therefore, is, yeah, they, there are definitely similarities. Boredom doesn't necessarily have the kind of level of intense criticism, self-criticism in it that depression has as well. So, so boredom can be part of depression, and so can all the kind of cognitive elements of boredom, but it doesn't necessarily have those kind of awful critical elements that, that depression has. That's very interesting. Once, when we are talking about Trump and, and narcissism, a related question to that is, do introverts or people who are depressed also find the most interesting subject to be themselves? That's a really good question. So it, it's, it's a good question to ask because um, when I talk about self, I don't necessarily mean the sort of me and who I am and all that kind of stuff. So for example, many introverts, that I know, I'm sort of relatively introverted myself, but many introverts I know actually live very much in a world of ideas, which kind of is themselves. It's really, really important. Their principles, the key things that go on for them. And so very often for some of my academic colleagues, for example, self-related actually means related to this field of study that I'm fascinated in and absorbed in. And it's very often quite egoless. So you don't feel like there's any superiority. There's no particular ego in that. But nevertheless, themself is their absorption in that study. So self-relatedness becomes part of that. And then, and then depression, um, if you think about depression, actually, sadly, one of, one of the kind of cognitive biases that occurs with depression is personalization. So depressed people will very often take things that seem to be impersonal. Somebody doesn't wave at them properly. Somebody yawns. Somebody looks a bit miserable and personalize it, relate it to themselves. And so actually, it's one of the painful things about depression is that very often things are very strongly self-related um, in a way that 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 isn't very helpful and, and can be quite painful to experience. Right, uh, this next section of Q&A is, is themed around uh, all this generation of kids is just terrible. <laughs> so much worse than we were. Uh, it, first question is, has our propensity for boredom changed over time? In other words, are kids today more easily bored? It, it, it's, it's a really debatable question, this one. So, so some people say yes. So some people say, if you look at kind of classic measures of boredom, um, maybe things like how much do they read? How much can they sustain a task? Things like that. Some people would say that, yes, that the youth of today, if you like, are more bored. Other people would say 
that, that actually what's going in is that, that the youth of today just have a lot of stimuli coming their way that's much more interesting than any of us had when we were kids. And so of course they're not gonna be attracted to things that are a bit more low energy and a bit more difficult. And so it's a bit of a challenge actually to get some youth anyway, engaged in those kind of things. So what's going on is the threshold for attracting attention has gone up. Um, and I think that's quite a challenge for education. It's quite a challenge um, for people like me teaching undergraduates as well. Um, but but part, part of the, part, part of what, what the self-relatedness literature does and the utility value intervention literature is talking about is really how do you take people who might not be interested and try and get them interested by helping them to see the relevance of what they're doing to themselves. Related question to that is um, it comes with, with a caveat. This may be me romanticizing the past. But I've noticed that parents of kids nowadays seem to be terrified of letting their offspring ever get bored. Anecdotally, my parents had no cause letting me get bored. Our kids were constantly being stimulated, being deprived of the skill that comes from working through boredom. Yeah, I, I think that's, I, I totally agree with that. The boredom actually is an essential ingredient of childhood. It's about, it's where a lot of our creativity comes from. It's where we decide to do some things rather than others. It's where perhaps some of our, our sort of lower emotional states are used where, when we study or read or do, do things like that. Um, I mean, while we're on what's missing in childhood, the other thing that's missing in childhood that there's a lot of good research on as well it is, is what some people call risky play as well. So high, high speeds, great heights, slightly risky things. Um, that, that's about children learning what's dangerous and what's risky and what isn't. So that, that's another thing that seems to be excluded. And, and I think the two things are linked because basically, certainly when I was a kid and I didn't have a computer on 24 seven or a screen to go to, if I got bored, I usually concocted something that was mildly dangerous to entertain myself. <laughs> Right, same same here. Um, related question to that, um, and also here is the last call for questions. If you have any more questions, please put them in the in the WhatsApp group. Uh, related question to that is: Is boredom good for you? So, so I I, I would take the view that all. Um, that, that no emotions are good or bad. So we need all our emotions. So, and, and the reason we tend to divide positive from negative emotions is that generally negative emotions have high action tendencies attached to them, which means fear wants to run, um, anger wants to fight, shame wants to hide. Um, and I, I actually think that the function of boredom, if we're gonna befriend boredom and like it for what it's trying to do for us, is that I think boredom, its aim is to try and get us engaged in things, basically. It's to say it's aversive not to be engaged and it's to aim to throw us into something that's worthwhile and good. Um, and so I, I think boredom, like all our emotions, has a really, really good function if we're only willing to go with it and follow it. Presumably uh, this is changing with all the devices that we now have at our disposal. I, am, I imagine a, uh, you know, a situation you're queuing in a supermarket um, 20 years ago, you would have been left to your boredom. Yeah. Now you've got your phone on you so you can browse the Twitter. Does that change our brain or our cognitive abilities at all? Yeah, well, what it means is that, that part, partly we're getting rewarded much more easily. So, so we don't have to sort of create a reward for ourselves. Um, but then the danger that, that sort of arrives with that is that, that we miss out on all kinds of other things that actually do us better in the long term, which means that um, it's like our brain is being lit up by a pinball machine that's being rewarded, 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 whereas actually the things that seem to make us happier are things that often aren't immediately rewarding, but are rewarding in the long term. And so I think that's the kind of danger that we find with a lot of mobile devices is that they're rewarding us very, very immediately and therefore forging patterns and habits in us. That, that I, and actually, I mean, I've been involved in designing apps that develop these things over long term. So they actually teach you to do gratitude, to have compassion, to get engaged in life and things like that. So, so our apps can do that for us as well. But the danger is that doom scrolling through YouTube, looking for the latest COVID app or you know, late COVID stats or whatever, you know, often doesn't do us a lot of good. So in Sam, it's okay to reach out for your phone if you're going to reach out for your app. 
<laughs> and uh, not Twitter. Last question that just came in. Uh, is there any documented relationship between boredom and uh, attention deficit disorders? Are people with ADD, ADHD more or less likely to be bored? Yeah, so, so that, that's a really, really good question. Um, I, and the interesting thing is looking at the boredom literature, as far as I know, in terms of what I've read so far, I haven't found anybody that's made that direct link. Um, and and do, you know, do you know what my guess would be? It is that in essence, it, one of the elements of ADHD is sort of skipping boredom and going straight to the engagement piece. What's entertaining me here? Here's this. So, so in a sense, you could say, yes, it's distractible. Yes, it's impulsive. But unless they're forced to sit still, not really bored, actually, actually quite highly engaged in life. And I think that's it for the question. So thank you very much. Over to you, Louise. Thank you, Roger. That was absolutely great.